First, we'd like to thank the Beaver Brook Fund for making this lecture possible. We are fortunate to have Dr. Allison Ormsby here to speak to us at the start of our session on balancing the needs of people and biodiversity conservation. Dr. Ormsby is an Associate Professor of Environmental Studies at Eckerd College in St. Petersburg, Florida. One of the primary challenges in conservation biology is how to combat the loss of biodiversity without sacrificing the responsibility to respect the needs of local communities. Dr. Ormsby has tackled this challenge, keeping sight of the human element in her work on behalf of endangered species and spaces. While earning her doctorate at Antioch University, New England, Professor Ormsby conducted research on the interaction between people and protected parks in Madagascar, bringing attention to the perceptions of local communities and building a framework for reducing future tensions. Her subsequent research on sacred forests in India, Ghana, and Sierra Leone similarly highlights the role of communities and cultures in the history of land conservation. Dr. Ormsby serves on the Society for Conservation Biology's Religion and Conservation Biology Working Group, as well as the International Union for Conservation of Nature's Task Force for Cultural and Spiritual Values of Protected Areas. Today she will speak about community involvement in conservation, informed by the unique experiences of her research and education work across the globe. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Allison Ormsby. Good afternoon. Hopefully this mic is working, yes. Um, I appreciate your attention after lunch. I know I'm gonna try to keep this lively. I wanna thank the organizers of this really interesting conference, in particular, Amy Cabanis, who personally invited me. I'm pleased to be here, and I uh, look forward to having a, a lively discussion. I know this is a little bit of a transition from our uh, earlier discussions, but I think that in terms of justice, there are a couple of key issues that do um, carry over. And what I'll be talking about, some of these issues are governance issues and access to natural resources. So who's governing these natural spaces and who's deciding who has access to the resources in them? And before I move on, I want to make a shameless plug for a program at Antioch University of New England. There's a master's program in community advocacy and organizing, which I think a lot of you might be interested in. It relates to the environmental justice issues. So you can look that up if you're interested. Uh, today I'll be talking about uh, from national parks in Madagascar to sacred forests in India, community involvement in conservation. And the pictures here, the one on the left, lower left, is clove harvesting in Madagascar. The center picture is uh, from an island conservation area off the coast of Madagascar, Nosimanga Bay. And then the one on the right is a festival at a sacred grove in India. I teach at Ecker College, which is a small liberal arts college in St. Petersburg, Florida, very much like Connecticut College. Uh, and I teach social science courses for the environmental studies major. So courses like wildlife policy, environmental education, ecotourism, protected areas. Uh, and someone asked me yesterday how I came to be interested in this topic. And so I thought I'd share that with you. Um, a lot of this is inspired by my experience as a Peace Corps volunteer 20 years ago in Sierra Leone, West Africa. And I was working with a wildlife sanctuary there. And that's where I really got interested in people-park interactions. So how local communities are involved or not involved in parks. And I also first found out about sacred forests or sacred groves when I was in Sierra Leone. And I was lucky enough to go back last year and continue research there 20 years later. But I won't be talking about that in this talk, unless somebody wants to talk about it in the questions session. What I'm going to be focusing on are two different approaches to conservation. An external approach, which is government-managed parks, uh, giving the example of Madagascar's Mashwala National Park, and an internal approach to conservation, which is community-managed sacred sites. Um, which I'm focusing on sacred forests or sacred groves, particularly the sacred groves of India. So a lot of you are familiar with Madagascar and have uh, probably seen programs about Madagascar. You're aware that there's um, been a history of habitat destruction and biodiversity loss. Um, there's been a lot of population growth and human needs that lead to pressures on natural resources. Things like charcoal production uh, and really large scale erosion so this is showing an erosion gully, and for scale, you can see this is a whole um, village or community. So the gullies are the size of a community. They're um, uh, irreversible. And then, uh, anybody know what one of the largest crops of Madagascar is? Exports? Vanilla, yes. 
Okay, so here's vanilla growing. Uh, so this is uh, what some people call slash and burn or Sweden shifting agriculture. And it's been, um, this air, cleared area has been planted with vanilla, which is an epiphyte and is hand pollinated in Madagascar since it's from Mexico originally. So I did my PhD research back in 2001 at Mashwala National Park. And that'll be the first half of my talk talking about that research. Mashwala is in the northeast corner of Madagascar on this peninsula. Uh, it was established in 1997 in part to protect the endemic red rough lemur, which is a top species. It also has the endemic tomato frog, a little bit less charismatic. Uh, so I was looking at people park interactions at Mashwala. My research questions were how do local residents perceive the park and perceive restrictions on use of natural resources in the park? How do the residents perceive and interact with park staff? And what environmental education programs might address any misconceptions or misperceptions and reinforce the park conservation goals? So this is focusing in closer on that peninsula. And this shows the park area. The land continues around here. Marin Setra is the town where the headquarters of the park is located. It's sort of the gateway town. And the hatched area you can see is the park. You might notice that it has a very irregular boundary shape. Uh, because it was, the, it, it was an integrated conservation and development project, and it um, did involve some community input, so some of the boundaries were formed around existing communities. So it, it's not an arbitrary square park. The gold areas are buffer zones. You can see that there's not buffer zones around the whole park. And the green areas are marine parks. So there's three affiliated marine parks. And there's also a detached park over here, which is, um, has Nepenthes, which is a pitcher plant, an um, endemic species of pitcher plant. So my research sites were Malevna on the west side and Ambutralana on the east side. You can see Malevna has a nice buffer zone. Ambutralana has fragmented buffer zones. And I'll be comparing these two areas. This gives you an idea of the landscape. Um, it's pretty hilly. This Malevna is right over in here before the hill. This is This is one of the uh, road, quote unquote roads, not, not terribly functional road. Here's the road. Um, this is um, Willie, who's the head of environmental education for the park, and Bay Marcel, who's a park um, agent, park ranger. And Madagascar has the largest per capita consumption of rice in the world, and here's some rice patties. Um, this is showing the terrestrial park is up here, and then down here is one of the marine parks with the community um, in between. And then this is showing another community that's near the edge of the park. Um, this is a fallow rice field. And then you can see a lot of erosion on the hillsides from um, uh, deforested areas that have gone too steep of a slope. OK, so this I'm going to go kind of quickly through my research uh, process. Uh, it, I use an ethnographic approach in my research. I, my training is environmental studies, but I use some anthropological methods. So I did partici participant observation, interviews with residents, coded the interview results, initial coding, developed some recommendations that I shared with park staff through a debriefing. At the conclusion of my research, I did an environmental education and communication workshop that wasn't originally part of my plan, but it happened. Uh, I refined my codes. I developed a per perceptions framework, which I'll share with you today. And then I came back in a later year and developed an environmental education curriculum for the park with park staff. So it's just showing a typical community interview. Damisi um, is a current teacher. I worked with translators. Um, the official languages of Madagascar are French and Malagasy. And I worked with teachers um, who speak French, since I was working in French. Uh, or retired or current teachers. This just gives an idea of the sample size. Uh, I interviewed a wide variety of stakeholders, residents, staff. There are quite a few uh, non-governmental organizations involved with the park, so I interviewed representatives of those organizations, like Wildlife Conservation Society, CARE. Um, the Ministry of Water and Forests is a government agency that is in charge of, um, would be, would be responsible for any timber extraction, for the illegal timber extraction. They should be regulating that. Um, and then I interviewed other NGO staff. Some group interviews, some individual interviews. And so the, my main findings were that there are four main factors that influence community perceptions of the park. One is the history of park management. How much do residents know about how the park was established and why? Um, one is just awareness of the park. Do park 
do the residents know where the park boundaries are? Do they know what, know what the rules are about using resources? And then again, community awareness of park staff. Do they know what the park staff are supposed to do? What, the, what are their feelings about the park staff? What, how, how frequent of interactions do they have? And then finally, what benefits does the community receive from the park? Um, tangible, intangible. And I'll go through each of these with some examples. So first, the history of park management. This is the park headquarters in Marnsetra, the, the gateway town. There's been a wide number of people involved with the park. Like I said before, it was an integrated conservation and development project initially. So initially, CARE was the NGO most involved with um, park implementation. Then that transitioned over to the, to the Wildlife Conservation Society. ANGAP is the old name for the Park Service of Madagascar. So there, the Park Service was involved, NGOs were involved, some other NGOs like Peregrine Fund and the Missouri Botanical Garden. Um, and then researchers from the University of Antananarivo, the capital city of Madagascar. Because of all these different stakeholders, residents are a little confused about who's running the park, where, who was involved, and if there were integrated conservation and development project um, activities like building schools or improving roads. It wasn't always known that that was actually affiliated with the park. That maybe, that, maybe CARE did that, but residents didn't know that that was one of the benefits from the park directly. It wasn't communicated. Similarly, some of the community was unaware of where the park boundaries were or they could claim they weren't aware so that there was um, incursions into the park. Uh, there are boundary signs, these signs in some areas, but you'll notice they're in Malagasy and French. Um, there's nothing, if you, if you couldn't read, you wouldn't necessarily know what that sign was about. So there's no sort of symbols that would give the message as well. And then this is a sign at the airport saying welcome to Mashwala National Park. So there's, um, I would say, a lack of community awareness of the park. And there haven't been, there weren't concerted education efforts. Um, this is one thing that, the, that WCS did do, is uh, produce a poster about the park, and it has um, an image of the terrestrial part of the park and the marine part. And this is one of the residents looking at, looking at the poster. All right, so I'll move on to the park staff. How did residents feel about the park staff? And I'm contrasting Malavana, where the sentiments were a little bit more positive with Ambutulana, where they were kind of negative. So Malavana residents said, NGAP, which is National Park Service, staff are necessary. If they were not here, the forest would be destroyed, there would be no water. People made a direct connection between having the standing forest as a watershed and having water in their rice fields. They, they clearly understood that linkage and, and brought it up a lot. They also said the park should be protected. Before the park was official, people destroyed the forest. Now NGAP is here to enforce the rules. In contrast, in Ambutulana, they said the job of the ANGAP staff is to protect the forest, to defend the forest from people cutting wood and doing tavi. Tavi is the Malagasy word for um, swood and agriculture. And when we talk about benefits, we're going to talk about the um, Ambutulana and the residents a little bit more. Here's the benefits. This is a typical house in uh, northeastern Madagascar, made of local materials. My Labour resident said, if the park prospers, village life will be easy and we'll find everything we need, lots of trees and medicinal plants. Remember that Malavina had a buffer zone. So there would be medicinal plants and um, palm, uh, Ravenal, this palm to make their houses. Ambudralana um, resident said, in the forest there's lots of wood and land, but outside the park there's very little. I want the wood in the park, but the agents, the ungap agents are here, so they can't get it. And I'm going to move on to talk about illegal, illegal rosewood trade. A lot of the Ambutralana residents are, or some, are involved in, the, um, in wood extraction. Before I move to that, I want to just um, share another conclusion, which is that there are all these different levels of natural resource pressure. Often local residents are blamed for the destruction of parks, but really we need to think about four scales. So at the local scale, there is Tavi, which is um, sweated in agriculture. At the regional scale, there's hunting. Lemurs are hunted for food, uh, particularly at holiday time. And those lemurs that are hunted are, uh, are sold at local markets and regional markets. At the national level, there's timber use, like palisandra, ebony, and rosewood. And that's used for furniture, primarily. The international level, there's timber trade. So the rosewood trade has really um, exploded since uh, there was a political crisis in Madagascar in 2006. So there's been really unregulated rosewood exports since then. Uh, so we need to remember that there's four scales of pressure, not just the local residents extracting. All right, so let's use rosewood as an example of these scales. So this, this is a precious tro tropical hardwood. It's in demand. Um, it's a highly valuable type of wood. Usually the logs are selectively extracted 
from the park. Not, this is illegal, but it ha happens. Um, so they're carried out by local individuals. They're brought to, this is in Ambuchalana, so I took, I took this picture, it's really quite open. Um, there's a sort of a little ferry and it's put onto the boat and taken to a larger regional capital where it's stockpiled. Again, I took this picture in somebody's, uh, basically their garage. Um, so they're stockpiled and then it's finally put onto a larger ship and probably even a larger one to be exported uh, to China or Japan, usually. Um, so this is tolerated. It's, it's known that it's illegal, but it's tolerated. Um, and it, it's showing all the different scales. And of course, the local residents are getting very little of the profit from this trade. So some of the, inc the implications of the research. Um, this is at the end I did, I helped um, Willie, the head of environmental education for the park, do a, run a workshop for park staff. One thing is that the park staff, their title is Agent of Conservation and Education. Um, but what I found was that they were really only doing the conservation part, not the education part. And residents perceived them as enforcers. So they saw the park staff and they were worried that they would get in trouble for harvesting wood or trapping lemurs. So by trying to uh, improve the education aspect of their job, then that could be more positive interaction. So I believe that park staff with appropriate training can improve residents' park perceptions and support conservation effectiveness. And I also believe that park protected areas should make efforts to improve residents' park perceptions and to reduce natural resource pressures at all scales, not just at the local scale. So after I finished my PhD, uh, I came back to, to Mashwala and I helped work with um, residents of park staff to develop an environmental education curriculum, which is called Miaraka, Miaro, and Mashwala. Let's all work together to protect Mashwala. It ties in with the national curriculum of Madagascar. They have, the Madagascar has um, standards or learning objectives for the country, but in this region there was nothing that related directly to the biodiversity of the region. So this gives local examples, local species examples, um, and then it was distributed, there's 110 schools in the park periphery, so it was distributed to those schools. There was a teacher training workshop led by park staff in September 2003. Okay, so now I'm gonna shift on to a totally different place. At the end, I'm happy to answer questions about Madagascar or, or India or um, any of this, these broad issues. So I'm gonna move from the government-run conservation program to a community-run conservation program. So uh, looking at India, two very different states in India, Meghalaya and Karnataka, and looking at this community tradition of sacred forests. I was lucky enough that when I had my sabbatical, I got a Fulbright Award, and I was a Fulbright Scholar in India for seven months. So that was fairly recently, in 2009 and 10. And I picked these two states because they're both biodiversity hotspots. The Western Ghats hotspot in, in Southwest India and the Indo-Burma hotspot in Northeast India. And Meghalaya, which is in the Northeast, is particularly known for its high orchid diversity. So just walking through a sacred grove, um, you can see orchids like this. This is a sacred grove in, this, in the Southwest. Um, and this is a shrine within the grove. So my research sites, has anyone been to India? Raise your hand if you've been. Okay, great, good. Oh yeah, of course the whole panel from yesterday. So this is kind of an interesting tie-in with yesterday. It's, um, it's much happier. Um, I, I was in very rural forested areas. Um, no e-waste, um, some environmental justice issues though, which I will talk about. Uh, so I was in Meghalaya, which is um, an often overlooked part of India, the Northeast, um, which you can talk about more if you want. Uh, it's north of Bangladesh. And then I was in the southwest Karnataka, which is sort of more what people in the U.S. traditionally think of India when they think of India. Okay, so what are sacred groves or sacred forests? These are community protected areas that are usually protected for religious reasons because people believe a god lives in the forest and it's respect for the god to protect the forest. They are, can be burial grounds as well. They're sacred forests in, in Madagascar and that's where the ancestors are buried. They might also have watershed value. So there may be a spring that originates from that forest or grove, and it's protected for that reason. Um, groves is a word for a smaller, smaller parcel, and forests are the larger ones. Usually in India, they're pretty much all protected out of respect for the forest god. But in other countries, this is a worldwide phenomenon. We do have some sacred forests here in the US. Um, so it varies, but there's, it's a community protected area. That's the important thing. And Often, most of the time, they're not government recognized and they're not government protected. So it's just the community that's managing them. 
India has the most in the world. There's over 100,000 sacred groves in India. And pretty much everybody, mm, maybe not everybody, but um, in most parts of India, especially rural areas, people know about these sacred groves. In Delhi, um, not as much. But I would talk to taxi drivers and be like, oh yeah, sacred, you're, you're researching sacred groves. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. The size varies from small plots, like this grove, which is only about four acres, to hundreds of hectares. And I'll show you some of the larger ones. So what are the benefits? Some of the ecological benefits are watershed benefits. If it has a spring, it's supplying fresh water. It helps reduce soil erosion, provides habitat for many species. Obviously, more habitat if it's a larger grove. Even small groves uh, can uh, act as a seed bank. So there's some species that have been extirpated outside the groves. They don't exist anymore, and they only exist now in the sacred groves. It also provides clean air. What are some of the threats? Natural resource pressures, which I kind of talked about with Madagascar, same kind of things in India. Firewood collection uh, in the groves. This is a bird snare. And this was a sacred grove. Obviously, it's not, not so much of a grove anymore. It's, um, it's no longer maintained. So there's a bird snare. And then in um, some areas, cultural change. So that can involve religious change. So if religious views change, then you don't believe in the god in the forest anymore, then you're not necessarily going to protect that forest anymore. So this is kind of interesting. In northeast of India, there's these monoliths, which um, have a variety of reasons why they may be there, but so sometimes they're sort of like more memorials, like we have gravestones. Um, and then this is a church. So in the northeast of India, most people have converted to Christianity. But it's interesting because this church has the sim symbolism of the monoliths on it. So sort of an interesting hybrid. Uh, the landscape changed. This southwest of India is the largest coffee producing region in India. So it's lots of coffee plantations. So this is coffee, and then it's, um, it is shade, shade grown coffee. So the standing trees could be native species, or they could be um, uh, silver oak, which is an introduced species. So it depends on the coffee plantation owner, whether they keep the native trees or they change to faster growing non-natives. If they keep the native trees, then it provides some uh, continuity for species, and that can be good. But pretty much in the southwest India, the area where I was, any non-coffee plantation is a sacred grove. That's all that's left. It's all been converted to coffee, except for the sacred groves. In the northeast, this is one of the environmental justice issues, big problem with coal mining. So this is just driving along a road, and this is all stockpiled coal, just out in the open stockpiled. Coal trucks just everywhere. And there's also, if you want to get into environmental justice in the Northeast of India, there's tons of material. Uranium mining, all kinds of, this is a tribal area of India, and it's, um, I'm not even going to get into the complications of that, but it's a minority group area. And some of the groves are fragmented. So you may have a road going through a grove, a rice paddy in a grove, or um, a trail, a walking trail to get to farms on the other side. And you guys know um, what some of the ecological problems of fragmentation are. So in India, my research questions were, what's the history of each sacred site? Why is it protected? What are the taboos relating to the grove? So each of these groves, no matter where I do the research, Ghana, Sierra Leone, India, there's some kind of rules. Um, so in each place, I try to find out what are those rules. Um, what are the management techniques? And what factors might have caused some changes in traditions and management over time? So I'm looking for the oral history of the grove, asking the same. I have a questionnaire that I use that asks the same questions of each um, interviewee. So similar kind of research methods, quantitative, qualitative. It's kind of a hybrid of qualitative and quantitative. Ethnographic approach, interviews, participant observation, focus groups. Anybody notice anything interesting about this photograph? From an environmental standpoint. What's this? Can you tell? Yeah, it's a, it's a pellet from a leopard cat, which is, a, which is an endangered species. Um, so this it was an interesting day because I saw that pellet, and then that night I came across someone who had, who had caught one, who had hunted one. Um, so there, that, I guess you could call that bushmeat. Um, so that was just interesting. People were very hospitable in India, welcoming us into their homes. I worked with, again, worked with translators. I was working in, with five different languages in India. Um, you know India is very diverse. Um, so I was working in two different small regions in five different languages. In Meghalaya, I conducted 72 interviews with residents of seven communities. 
And in Karnataka, 84 interviews at nine locations. And so these are the Meghalaya research sites. Each of the triangles is a, is a site. I was based in Shillong at a lovely university, Northeastern Hill University, in their environmental science department. Um, and just to remind you, we're in northeast of India. So coming out from Shillong and going to these different communities that had sacred groves. And there they're called Laukentong, which is God's forest. In general, the results from Meghalaya, there are fewer groves, but they're larger in size. Um, the management status of the groves is changing, and there's been some impacts from tourism and cultural change. So I'll go over these results briefly. This is one of the large groves. It's 77 hectares. It's Muflong. There's actually a National Geographic special about it. Maybe you've seen it. Maybe you will see it. Uh, it is a tourism area, and it's, um, people come from Shillong, which is an hour away, to picnic in this grassland area. So you, would, you could picnic there, but you wouldn't go into the forest. Um, because really you would only go in the forest if it was a time when there was a ceremony for the forest god. And you would, certainly wouldn't go in if you weren't local and you didn't know about that forest god. You would just know not. This, since it's a tourist site, there are rules posted about what you're not supposed to do there. In each of the um, communities, I interviewed the local stakeholders or the elders who manage the forest, um, like Tambor Lingdo, and then asked if it were possible for me to go into the forest with, accompanied by someone. And in India, that was generally not a problem. Um, when I was working in Sierra Leone, that is a different story. Um, so this is a path through the grove. Like I said, there's often paths that go to farms on the other side. And it's fine, it's usually acceptable to take that path. This is the largest um, sacred grove in Northeast India that I studied. It's 122 hectares. Again, it has a really hard boundary between the grassland on the edge and then the forest of the grove. This is an interesting site. It's also a tourism site. And these are the only two sites out of um, I, many groves that I looked at. Um, that had tourism. And this one, this area right here, under here is a cave. And so here shows the parking lot going to the cave and tour buses. And so going to the cave is a, is a big tourism destination. But people who are going in here at the entrance don't even know that they're entering a sacred grove because it's not signed. So they just go to the cave and it can lead to some problems with trash um, and other issues. And these are some of the women that are stakeholders, their families are um, associated with management of the grove. So I want to wrap up Meghalaya so I can move on to Karnataka. Um, the influence of the conversion to Christianity of many residents in Meghalaya appears to be weakening the protection of sacred forests. Because when you convert to Christianity, you no longer believe in the forest god. As this resident said, we worship God in church, so we don't have to worship in the forest anymore. So there used to be festivals aff affiliated with the groves in the Northeast, and now they're diminishing, and they don't have the festivals as much, or some of them, they just stopped doing them. And so they were forgetting the cultural tradition of the groves. I didn't really talk about this, but the practice of hunting seems to have led to a loss of fauna in the sacred forest, although floral diversity appears to be high. It just happens that the two areas I picked in India are areas where hunting and meat eating are still quite active. You may think that because of Hinduism, there's no eating of meat in India that is incorrect. Um, and then there's lots of, the, the folks in Northeast are not Hindu. They're um, either Christian or they believe in Sankasi, which is the traditional religion. Um, so that's interesting. And many sacred groves have transitioned to weaker forms of protection. So once a grove is no longer sacred, it could become a community forest, which means it can be harvested about every 15 years. It's still managed, and it's still limited um, harvest, but it can be harvested. And then the next level is a private forest. Once it changes designation to, designation to a private forest, it can be sold. So, the, so as I interviewed people, I saw that some of them had transitioned, and they're becoming less protected. All right, I'm gonna move, we're moving to the south now. I felt like I was going to another country. I'm still in India, three months later. Um, but this is all Hindu. Uh, it's this one small district within the state of Karnataka. It's about six hours from Bangalore. Uh, and uh, these are all the research sites, these um, dots. And again, I was, based, I was based in Phnom Penh at the um, Forestry College and um, worked with a translator, Lavin, and uh, went out to these different communities. And sacred groves in the south southwest are called Devarkadu, which again is God's forest. And I also was lucky, in the spring, there are festivals associated with the groves, and I, so I happened to be able to, it only happens once a year, and I happened to be able to attend some of those festivals. Like here, we're at a festival trying to do a focus group interview, which is challenging. Um, so one of the conclusions from this area is that the temples have gone through a progression. Um, some of the older 
temples or shrines that are within the grove uh, would be something like this. It's just offerings to the forest god on the ground. These are terracotta dogs. The, the um, god in the groves here is Ayapa, who is a hunting god. And so l small horses or dog figures would be offerings for that god. So if, if I happen to go to a grove that had these, I know that that's an older grove or hadn't been modernized. So it would start with those stones or symbols. And then a grove that had been more modernized might have a cement base like this one. It has the offerings, but they have built a cement base under it. Um, and then maybe there's a wire enclosure around it. And finally, the improved groves had this huge temple structure in the middle of the grove. Of course, as this is happening, the grove is being cleared. And so there's more of an opening in the center where the temple is being enlarged. So this is seen as uh, respect for the god, but in terms of the grove, it um, diminishes the ecological value of the grove. So to, just to summarize some of the results from, from Southwest India, the groves, this is a little complicated, um, because like I said, there's 100,000 groves in India. In this particular um, area of India, the groves are co-managed with the forest department. This is a government department. Um, so that's really unusual, and it has some advantages and some disadvantages. So the rest of India, they, the groves will be managed by temple committees, um, community committees only. But this one has a sort of a, a blend. As I mentioned, there's been a shift in the role of the grove, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. Um, some of the groves have been converted to crops, cash crops like coffee. This one, this is a um, walkway to a temple. It's got coffee, bananas, and coconut. The idea is that if, if that's planted there, then it can be sold to use the money to make improvements to the temple. So it's not seen as a conflict of management or con conflict of interest. It's helping to, uh, to have respect for the, the god in, in the grove. And then you can see this, this is a shrine in the middle of a grove, but the, this grove has also been um, diminished. So many sacred groves have transitioned from a focus on the grove with a small shrine in it to a focus on the temple that happens to be in a grove that's supporting the temple improvements. And in the Southwest, many groves have been encroached for coffee plantations or other resource use, whether intentional or unintentional. The coffee is being seeded in by birds naturally. Um, and in some cases, people actually just kind of move their coffee plantation a little bit into the grove. What the Forest Department did was demarcate a lot of these groves with boundary stones. So this, you can see, was the boundary of the grove. Here's the grove over here. Here's a coffee plantation. So the grove used to come all the way up to this edge. But you can see there's a path along here. So the, the groves kind of shrunk a little bit. Um, the Forest Department also put up these signs on many of the groves in the area, which I, I love the slogans. They're all different. This particular one says, destroy the environment, curse the world. So overall conclusions for India, I believe there's a potential for the cultural traditions behind the sacred groves to make a valuable contribution to conservation with support. Because the groves have really different origins, a diversity of approaches to management, different religious beliefs associated with them, that they need a varied approach. We can't come up with one simple way to manage all the sacred groves in India, much less all the sacred forests in the world, um, although people talk about that. And then looking at Madagascar and India in comparison, we can ask ourselves, what should be the role of government representatives? For example, the park staff or the National Park Service in Madagascar or the Forest Department in India. How can they be most effective in supporting these community residents and community uh, needs and letting communities have access to the resources in these groves or continue to perform the ceremonies that they have been doing? Should the groves be demarcated with the boundary stones or with fence, fencing? A lot of um, residents actually talk about fencing, and some of the groves are partially fenced. And there's pros and cons, of course. And then should rituals be revitalized? And what would that look like? So thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Questions? Yes. So, um, I guess I have a question. Is the state forest there any thought about ecological management, or is it completely just a, a, a religious management of the forests? Um, there, yes, there's thought about ecological management for sure. Uh, most of it is a hands off approach, but there is some fire management, so fire breaks around the groves. Um, I mean, there's management in terms of the taboos. So pretty much in all the groves, no collection of firewood, no hunting, um, and then no, nothing, like no defecation, 
um, nothing, no inappropriate um, behavior. Um, so it's, it's conscious, it's more, it's more of a um, let nature take its course approach, but it's, they're definitely being managed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would say the Sacred Park came first in India as well, because God was there. Right. I'm just wondering, in Thailand, a lot of the time, it's when the forest Okay. Is okay. Right. Yes. And that's the same in India with the Chipko movement. You guys hopefully know about the Chipko movement. Um, so people use this as a political strategy, yes. Um, in India, they've been thinking about how can we... Um, how can we make more sacred groves, maybe? And so I've heard in Rajasthan, in the um, northern part of India, that they've d there's this blessing ceremony where you sprinkle saffron water around the edges of groves to um, signify and work with the forest department so that it's, it's recognized by the community and by the government. So it could be something like that. And then in Sierra Leone, where there was a war, 11-year um, uh, civil war, a lot of groves were um, uh, burned or destroyed during the war intentionally as a um, anti-community uh, movement. So there's been re-sacredizing of groves after the war to re-bless them in a way and, and kind of make them sacred again. So I think it, there could be a very active community role. Um, it just has to be, I think, careful about the intentionality of it and, and how it's done and the future management. But yeah, it's possible. Yeah, yeah. How do the Christian uh, church leaders in the northern state frame This is, this is a really delicate question, actually. Um, and I, and I, when I presented my results in, the, in the, that area, I was highly criticized for my conclusion about Christianity. Um, so I hope I'm not offending anyone. Um, uh, I, I think that a future study would be working just with the, the Christian leaders, um, which I did not do. So, but I think that would be very useful. Because I, in other countries like Papua New Guinea, um, Christian leaders are used to be pro-environmental in, in Bible verses, and um, there's, a, there's a good synergy going on. Um, but in Northeast India, for some reason, it's seen as a dichotomy. You either, I think it's also um, moder modernity. So it's like you believe in um, the Christian God, so you can't, you can't have both. Whereas in Hinduism, it was very easy to just have the forest God be you know, part of the, the pantheon of Hindu deities. Or, or they actually like put a Hindu deity in on top of the forest god. Because these are pre-Vedic. Um, these are before Hinduism gods, so, uh, from what I've, from the research. Um, so I think there could be, I think an opportunity to work with the um, religious leaders in the Northeast. And I think that's the next step, would be trying to, trying to find some middle ground where um, you could respect the forest beliefs and still be a Christian um, and not have it to be one or the other. Because if not, the, the groves will be gone. There's no question about it. Or they have to convert to tourism, which I don't think is, is the answer either. Yeah. Um, listening to your presentation, especially about the India component, um, I got this impression that culture was um, sort of perceived as a way to push conservation into a more, um, so, so to speak, better state. And I was wondering um, if you saw this model of combining religion with um, conservation as like a new model from mm -hmm. Fantastic. I'll just summarize in case you didn't hear. Could working, um, combining religion and conservation be sort of a new model as opposed to the old model, which is basically exclude people and just set up, it's fortress conservation. And yes, I agree. I, that, yes, that's sort of where my work has gone. And there's a lot of recent um, work on combining religion and conservation. Because in the past, uh, traditional scientists kind of shied away from religion because it's like that's sort of a separate thing and we don't want to go there. Um, we're just going to we're just going to protect biodiversity. But I think now people are realizing that, that it's effective conservation involves people. And so you have to look at what people believe and, and try to work together and bridge um, religious communities and scientific communities. So I think um, that community belief systems can support conservation. And conservation can be more effective if it takes into consideration the beliefs that are there. So there's been, um, there's been a lot of work on that recently. So I think that's the way of the future. Yeah. Been, been about 10 years since she 
I wish I did. So the question is, how, is there any follow-up on the curriculum that I um, helped develop for Madagascar? Um, Madagascar is really complicated, and unfortunately, since I was there, or while I was there, there has been uh, p two political crises, um, at least two, and um, a disputed uh, head of state. So, like I said, the rosewood um, trade has gotten huge. It's happening in the northeast of Madagascar. That's the main rosewood area of the country. Um, so, the park has been sort of it's been sort of a free for all. Um, I do know there's two other actually com community conserved areas in Madagascar right next to where I was. Um, so I know that the curriculum has been, I, I went back and worked on a curriculum for one of those community conserved areas also. And part of the curriculum of these animal cards, they're sort of like playing cards with, for animals. And so I know from another person who was working there, she came across these cards in use. Um, so I know they're in use, but I haven't been able to get a, a full update. Um, there's also supposed to be a visitor center developed for the park, but pretty much everything was put on hold um, since 2006 with the political crisis. So um, this is a problem with international funding for conservation projects um, that unfortunately with the in political instability, um, people weren't getting paid, park staff weren't getting paid, and um, it's been really um, inconsistent, shall we say. One last question. Or not? Ah, uh, hi. <laughs> uh, is there a tribal cultural organization? Yes, I'm so glad you asked that. Great. Wonderful. I'm so glad you asked that because I meant to say that. Because we talked about. Um, NGOs a lot during this conference and sort of you should join an NGO or the NGOs are involved. So there are, there are quite a few. There's tons of NGOs in India actually. Um, in the Northeast, uh, there, it's, it's ver a very different dynamic. So I worked in both um, areas. I worked with what are called scheduled tribes in the constitution of India, um, not to be confused with scheduled castes. So these are minority groups that are, some of which are identified by the government of India. In the Northeast, they're really um, very politically um, organized under Sankasi. Sankasi is the um, religion, traditional religion, but it's also this political group, the same name. Um, but it's more political and less environmental. Um, but they are, they are very organized, so they can um, mobilize to, to, for whatever the goal might be. In the Southwest, it's a little bit clearer. Um, it's, they have something called the Kodagu Model Forest Trust. And they are doing a lot of environmental education activities with sacred forests, noting this change, the temple change, um, educating the young folks, because there's also this um, generational change, where the younger generations may be like, ah, we don't want to deal with these sacred forests. So it, kind of reaching out to them and saying, this is your cultural heritage, be proud of it, keep the festivals going. Um, so I think it's great, and, and there's lots more um, environmental NGOs in India that are Indian environmental NGOs. So I think that they're, I think partnership with these is really the way forward, and um, having them take an active role, and, and then having those groups work with the government to still have the community committees have the, the, the final word on what happens in the groves, not changing, some people say, why don't they just make them all parks? That would give, that would give up all community rights if that happened. So I don't support that. So thank you very much for your attention.